Awesome. So um, the name of this talk is, stay with a second. The name, 230. The name of this talk is <laughs> Love, Same-Sex Attraction, and Tolerance, um, which is just, no, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that. We're not going to talk about that. Um, here's why. You're like, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going to the Holy Spirit one. Um, <laughs> no, no, we're not going to talk about that because, because here's the thing. When it says love, same-sex attraction, and tolerance, um, no, tolerance, no. Because here's why. Here's, here's why. Just bear with me. Tolerance is something you do to them. You know, tolerance is something that you do for, for someone who's, like, you don't tolerate us, we tolerate them. And when it comes to the church, when it comes to this topic, we are not called to tolerance. And when it comes to the topic, we're not called to even, like, something like acceptance. What we're called to is to say this. It's, so this talk, so just so you know, because I know for a fact that there's people in this room right now who you saw the, the second word, the love, same-sex attraction, and you're like, that's me. That's part of your experience. And my, or that's part of someone in your family, someone you love very, very much. That's part of their experience. And you, and you can sit here, and one of the things you can sit here, you can sit here afraid. Like, what's he going to say next? Like, what's, when, when's it going to come? And I start talking about this, and your ears start getting warm, and you're like, just please. You start getting that thing in your gut. You're like, just please don't say, any, don't, don't say anything wrong. Like, just what's he going to say? And the first thing I have to say is this, that what, not, none of what I'm going to talk about today has anything to do with tolerance, because tolerance is about them. But when it comes to the church, it is never us and them. So we get here in a church, church conference and stuff, and we're like, let's all talk about them over there. False, never, that's not it, why? Because if you experience, or someone you know experiences same-sex attraction in the church, you are not tolerated by the church. Not only that, you're not accepted by the church. The truth of the matter is, you belong in the church. You're not tolerated, you're not accepted, you belong. So it's not about us and them, it's just about us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so it's not about them, it is just about us. It's not about them, it is about us. So it's not about tolerance, it's not about acceptance. If you experience, or anyone you know or love experiences same-sex attraction, they, you, we belong. You belong. You're not tolerated. You belong. This is not about them. This is about us. But the next thing is this. This is going to be, this might be though, so, so if you're worried, this is going to be, a, this is a safe place. That's the first thing. Safe place, why? Because we're talking about us. But the second thing is, this not, that's not to say this isn't going to be hard or this isn't going to be difficult. Because <laughs> that's one of the things. It's the reality of life is that life is difficult. We sometimes expect life to be easy. I remember I picked up a book, um, and we expect, like, no, 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 it should, be, it, should, it should be butterflies and roses, and, like, give me some of the thing I like, whatever that, I was going to say honey, but I don't know. <laughs> butterflies, roses, honey, I don't know. Um, sometimes we think that, we, no, 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 you should just be able to, life is about getting what you want, life is easy, it's supposed to be easy. I remember there was this book by a guy named M. Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled, and I didn't read the whole thing. Actually, I didn't even read the first chapter. I read the first line on the first page of the first chapter, and then I was like, that's awesome, and I put the book down and put it away. But I got a lot out of that first line, and the opening line of this whole book has these three words. Life is difficult. I was like, that's true. And if we walk through life thinking that, no, no, it's not supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be like the, again, sunshine and butterflies and honey or roses. And it's like this. How frustrating would that be if, how frustrating would it be that if you thought you, went, you were going on an all-inclusive, like, vacation cruise, and all of a sudden you realized that you were on a battleship, not a cruise ship? And you're thinking, like, I mean, that would, it'd be bad enough to be on a battleship. Like, they're shooting at us. What's happening right now? Like, but if you thought, like, no, 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 they're supposed to be Mai Tais and margaritas, and people are supposed to come by and help me and give me more food and, like, tuck me in at night. Like, but they're making me work, and they're not only that, they're trying to kill me. This is not fair. Like, right, because you're not on a cruise ship, you're on a battleship. 
our life is not a cruise ship. Our life is a battleship. It's like the frustration of saying that I thought this was going to be a picnic field and it's actually a battlefield. Life is not easy. Life is, life is difficult. Life is difficult. It's not about them. It's about life is not easy. Life is. And so that means all of us are going to be challenged. That's why this whole talk today is not about them. It is really, actually, I'm not just saying it. It is about us. Because guess what? What, Father? Um, here's what. All of us, <laughs> all of us have bodies. And um, so maybe some of you heard this before. I, back when I was in seminary, a little story. I came home for a long weekend, and I, you know, brought my bag up to the room I grew up in, my bedroom I grew up in. And on my bed, my mom had placed a, uh, a children's book that she bought for me in graduate school, because that's where she thought my reading level was. And, and it was a book that she had heard um, was read after a funeral that she had gone to of a friend of hers. And at the end of the, it, the, the book is about, like, the, you know, what happens after you die. A lot of the stuff was kind of nice, you know. It said, you know, in the next place, uh, I'll no longer be sad. There'll no longer be tears. I'll be with all the people that I love, all the people that I've lost, all the people who went ahead of me will be reunited. And all, all of those things, we say, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds pretty good. But then it went on to say, in the next place, I'll no longer be tall or short. I'll no longer be fat or thin. I'll no longer be a boy or a girl. In fact, I won't even have a body at all, and I'll finally be free to just be me. So I went downstairs in the kitchen, and my mom, my mom was like, oh, did you like the book? And I was like, well, uh, it's, it's heresy. <laughs> my mom was like, but I liked it. I'm like, well, you're a heretic, mom. That just, <laughs> deal with it. I mean, <laughs> because, because that's the truth. The truth of the matter is, if you're a human being, if you are a human being, what a human being is, is a body and a soul together. What you are, what I am, what we are, is we are not just souls trapped in bodies. We are a body and soul together. In fact, we, we believe that God's ultimate plan for us after we die is we believe in the resurrection of the body. We believe that we get our bodies back. So the idea is for all eternity, if you're a girl, for all eternity, you will have a woman's body glorified, redeemed in heaven. If you're a guy, for all eternity, God's plan is that you will have a man's body forever in heaven. <sighs> In the next place, you actually will have a body. Because, I mean, think about this. What do you call a soul without a body? A ghost, exactly. It's like Casper. I mean, we, that's what, a soul without a body is a ghost. It's not, it's, that's a partial human being. What do you call a body without a soul? It's like, it's, it, your answer just revealed to me whether you, or not you watched The Walking Dead. <laughs> because some of you said, oh, it's a corpse, like you're dead. And some of you are like, you're a zombie. You're walking around. But that's what it is. I mean, a soul without a, a body without a soul is either a corpse or if it's been animated some way, it's a zombie trying to eat your brain. Um, but, but a human being, God's plan for you as a human being is that your body and soul are together. I mean, here's just a quick example. Um, you, sir, in the glasses? Yes, sir. Could you come forward, please? Give him a round of applause. What is your name? Uh, Kevin. This is Kevin. Everyone say hi, Kevin. Hi. Now, um, okay, just, just in a second. Could everyone just look at Kevin's body? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kevin, give it. Nice. Give us a little twirl. Nice. <laughs> so thanks, guys, Kevin. Well done. Well done. Now, now, you were like, you laughed when I said look at Kevin's body, but what were you already looking at? You were already looking at Kevin's body. You're like, look at his body. I can't look at his body. <laughs> of course, Kevin, well done. He's like just breaking out the guns like, oh, yeah? You want to see body? <laughs> Check it out. But, but that's the thing. Is that you've never, we've never known someone except through their body. You've never known anyone except, th actually, you've never known anything except through your body. Everything you and I know came to us through our bodies. We saw it with our eyes, we heard it with our ears, we felt it, we thought about it with our brains, part of some people's body. <laughs> that, that we've never known, you've never known anyone except in and through their body. Because when you say, look at Kevin, we look at Kevin's body, who are you looking at? You're looking at him. 
you're looking at Kevin. The body, St. John Paul II said this, the body and it alone reveals the invisible, makes visible what's invisible, the spiritual and the divine. We can, we can know that Kevin is here because his, we see his body. We know Kevin's soul is here because of his body. The body and it alone makes visible what's invisible. So here's what the foundational principle. You are your body. You are your body. You are your body. Therefore, if you are your body, then what you do with your body matters. Amen? Okay, okay so here we go. Let's, let's review. This talk today is not about them. It's about life is not easy. Life is. And if you are your body, then what you do with your body matters. Right, exactly. So that's our starting point. So not just like where my heart is, not just where, I, where my intentions are, but what I do with my body actually is me. It matters. It matters. Okay, amen. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. Pause. <laughs> so excited. Here's a little philosophy lesson. A little philosophy. Let's go back to this. So... If I am my body and what I do with my body matters, I can either use a thing according to what it's made for, like a body, human being, whatever, or I can use it against what it's made for. I can either use it in conjunction with how it's been created, or I can violate it. I can violate the nature of a thing. I don't know if you've ever heard the term nature. Have you heard the term, not like, <laughs> like trees and butterflies and honey? Yeah, like, but like the nature of a thing is this. The nature of a thing is the what it isness of a thing. Okay, the nature of a thing is the what it isness of a thing. So here's the thing. This is a, this shares the nature of chair. Um, it shares the what it isness, it shares in chairness, right? That's what they say, it's the, the what it isness. Now, you can find out the what it isness by answering the question, the what it is forness, right? <laughs> Makes sense. In the front row, they're like, I, you just, I don't <laughs> speak English, Father. What is a chair for? To sit upon, exactly. So the what it is forness reveals the what it isness. The, the what it is forness reveals the nature of the chair. So now, I am, I am using the chair for the end which what, with which it was created. Get it, the end for which it was created? Oh! Well, what do you think about that? So I'm using the chair according to its nature, according to its purpose, for the end which it was created. Okay, that's chairness. This is a table. It shares the nature of tableness. What is the what it is forness of a table? What's a ch table for? Food. Food, yes. It's broader than that, but yes. It's to set stuff on, right? I heard that, to set things on. You set things upon a table. So, here we go. I'm going to use the table for the end for which it was created. Bam, oh my gosh, there it is, right there. Ta-da! Okay. Now, now, so I have the, the what it is forness and the what it isness. We have the tableness, we have chairness. This is to set, sit upon, this is to set things upon. But watch this. Wait for it. Oh, what did he just do? I can't believe it. I now just, now, you guys. <laughs> so, the nature of a chair is to sit upon, but I just set something on it. So, question. Did I just violate the nature of a chair? <laughs> I hear we're confused. I didn't violate the nature. I just used it for my own purposes. My own purposes did not violate the nature of chair because you can still sit on it. Same thing when it comes to the table. <laughs> I want to make sure before I sat on it. No, am I violating the nature of table by sitting on the table? No, I'm, I'm very careful. I'm somewhat propping myself up. Um, but... I'm not violating tableness. I'm not violating what it's for. And it's even though I'm using it for my own purposes. So you have the end of a thing, the nature of a thing. You, have, you can use it according to the purpose, meaning like you set something on the table, sit on the chair. Or you can use it for another purpose and still not violate the nature of table or chair. Now, here's a question. I, don't bring, I didn't bring one because I had to go on a plane. What's the nature of an ax? <laughs> to chop, or exactly, to chop things. To cut things, to chop things. Now... You could take an axe and you can chop wood, right? That's using it according to its nature, right? Right. You could take the axe and you could chop, um, Kevin, right? <laughs> you could take the axe and you could chop Kevin's library books in half. You could just like, 
and you wouldn't be violating the nature of the acts. And you also could take, no offense, Kevin, you could take uh, Kevin's distant cousin Ralph, <laughs> and you could chop Ralph. <laughs> now, if you chopped Kevin's distant cousin Ralph with the axe, would you be violating the nature of axe? Yes. No, you're, using, you're chopping, that's what it's for. <laughs> Are you doing something wrong? Yes. Well, it depends on Ralph, you know what I mean? <laughs> it really, let's, let's be honest here. We don't know Ralph, maybe he, maybe he deserves to be chopped, I don't know. Probably, yes. You're not violating the nature of acts, but you could be doing something wrong by using the acts according to its nature, but for something evil. Okay, we have all these things. So now, we have nature of a thing, we have the purpose for it, it's made. What if, what if this? I took a table, and I propped up my car on the table to change the oil. Would I pretty quickly violate the nature of table? Yeah, yeah, pretty quickly. What if I took um, a big, big stump and started splitting wood on this chair? Would I pretty quickly violate the nature of chair? Yeah, what if I took that, that axe and instead of chopping wood, I started driving in railroad spikes with the blade edge of the axe. So I pretty quickly violate the nature of axe. Yeah, totally. So, so here we have the nature of a thing, the what it is forness. I can use it according to my own purposes and still not violate it. And I can use it according to purposes that actually end up ultimately violating the very reason that it exists. Does that make sense? So now, here's what I know you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about sex. Because I know that's why the entire conference is in this room. Because you're all a bunch of perverts. And you just, you, you just saw the word sex on there. Like, I'm going to that talk. I can't, I want more. I want to hear more about this. OK, if you were, a, if you were, a, sorry. All the, all the adult leaders are like, I am so disappointed in that priest. I just. But he knows the kids. He knows them. <laughs> Nailed it. So if you're, a, if you're an alien scientist, you came down to Earth, and you're trying to investigate, like, what are the, what's the nature of all these things that human beings do? And you, and you investigated as a scientist. You investigated sex. You'd say, okay, what, here's the nature of sex. What's the what it is forness of sex? Like, what is sex for? Just scientifically, just observing, what is it for? What's, it, what's the purpose? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think I heard babies. In which case, seriously? <laughs> no, yes, yes, babies, baby. A procreation is a big fancy word for that. If you were to study this, okay, what's the, what's the natural result of this? Oh, that's what this is for. This is for procreation, yes, for babies. Another end or another purpose of sex is also for the unity of the couple. In fact, that's even a biological thing, where as a, as a man and woman enter into the sexual embrace, their body releases certain hormones that actually are like bonding hormones, that they become physically and emotionally, chemically bonded to each other. So the two ends of sex, the two what it is fornesses of sex is procreation and union, or another way to say it is babies and bonding. Those are the two ends, the two like, that's just what, that's what it is for. Just like a table is for setting things on, a chair is for sitting on, that's the end, that's what it's for. Okay, now let's take a break from sex. I know, I'm getting warm. So, let's talk about <laughs> eating. Mm, we just did that. What is, what, what's, the, what's the nature of eating? What's the what it is forness of eating? Yeah, nourishment, energy. So nourishment and pleasure, yeah. <laughs> These are the two ends. These are the two what it is fornesses of eating. These, this human act is for nourishment and for the pleasure you get from eating a meal. Now, Question, have you ever, have you ever been running late for school and, or for whatever, and rather than sitting down and having a nice, delicious breakfast, you just grab like a power bar on your way to, on your way to work, on your way to school, which is not delicious, right? So in that case, you were not eating for pleasure, you were eating for nourishment, right? Right, now, in that case, since you were eating more for pleasure than for, or more for nourishment than for pleasure, were you violating the nature of eating? No, not at all. You just were emphasizing one over the other. Now, have you ever had this situation where you went out to like a nice restaurant and you had this great meal and you're like, oh my gosh, I am so stuffed. I couldn't eat another bite. And they come along with a dessert tray. And like, hello, would you, can I interest you in double, double chocolate, chocolate, fudge, fudge? And you're like, mm, yes, yes. <laughs> and in that case, you are not, you are definitely not eating for nourishment. <laughs> You've had all the nourishment you needed, but you said, you, I'm going to eat for pleasure. Now, in that case, are you violating the nature of eating? No, you're just emphasizing one over the other. Now, this is the next part. It's a little sensitive. 
very sensitive, actually, because I know this, this does affect people who are in this room as well. It's one of those things that some, some people in this room, you might struggle with this, so I don't bring it up lightly, but it is an important thing. There could be a situation where you could violate the very nature of eating by thwarting one or two of those ends. Say someone who eats something for pleasure but doesn't want the nourishment and so they make themselves throw it back up. I know that many people struggle with this, but in that case, is that person violating the nature of eating? Yeah. I'm working directly against one of its natural ends. Working directly against one of the natural ends of eating. And I just, you know, if this is you, if this is someone you love, it's one of those experiences where you know, like if someone were to say, you call it a human act, Father, like animals eat too. Like, right, but, but if you're someone who, who struggles with this, you know that it's not something that's just like, oh, I just violated it, it's no big deal. You know that this hurts you. You know that this is one of those things where you're like, I feel so ashamed. You know, this is one of these things that like, when I, here's this thing that's meant to be integrated, nourishment and pleasure of food. But when I work against it, not only do I disintegrate the act of eating, I disintegrate, I feel disintegrated. And I talk to so many people who, who struggle with an eating disorder, struggle with that, that kind of battle. And they say, no, uh, I hate this about it because, again, it's not just about food. I feel like I'm being pulled apart because I can't do this human action, even a, a small human action of eating and intentionally violate it without actually disintegrating my very self. And if that's the case when it comes to food, how much even more so is that the case when it comes to sex? Because food is relatively impersonal. But if I were to, if anyone were to enter into the sexual embrace with the intention of I'm going to violate either, either end of sex, procreation or union, babies or bonding, I'm disintegrating the very nature of the thing and I can't do that without actually disintegrating myself. Now, of course, it's just like when it comes to eating, there can be situations where here's a couple and they want to achieve pregnancy, and so they say, you know, okay, well, she's ovulating right now. Let's enter into the sexual embrace. Um, they're not necessarily doing that because they want the union, because they feel incredibly united to each other or intimate with each other. They're doing it because we want to have a baby. Now, they're not violating the nature of unity, but they are doing it more towards the nature of procreation. At the same time, you could have a couple that says, no, we're not trying to achieve pregnancy, but we have this union we desire, and so we're entering into the sexual embrace for the union. We're not violating the nature of, not violating the possibility of procreation, but we're entering into the sexual embrace with the intention of union. But just like with eating, you know that there's ways you can work against either one of the ends of marriage, one of the ends of sex. And what, how, how, how do people work against the end of procreation? It's called Contraception. And one of the things that contraception does is it actually, it violates the very nature of the sexual embrace. And what it ultimately does is it violates the very nature of a human being. And, and if you're like, well, Father, that's a Catholic thing. Okay, fine. It's a Catholic thing. Actually, do you know this? That until 1920, every single Christian denomination believed that until 1921. And all of a sudden people started saying, well, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not. Hey, guess, guess uh, about rates of divorce. Guess what they've done since 1921? Have they gone up or gone down? They've gone skyrocketed. 50 to 60% of married couples end in divorce. Virtually, virtually all of those couples contracepting. You know what the rate of divorce is for practicing Catholics who don't contracept? It is somewhere around 1% to 2%. Think about this. Because some of you, a couple of you are called to marriage. The rest are called to be priests and nuns. But... A couple of you are called to marriage. And you say, I want to have a marriage that lasts for life. Awesome. I would do anything to have a marriage that lasts forever. Wonderful. Would you be willing to never, ever enter the, enter the sexual embrace using contraception? Because if you want to think of like one silver bullet that will help you in your long-lasting marriage, 50%, 50 to 60%, all the way down to 1% to 2%. That seems like kind of a game changer. And it also seems like a huge indication that what I'm talking about when it comes to violating the nature of the sexual embrace, working against procreation, actually doesn't just like, oh, I just violated the sin or I violated the whatever. It's actually, I violated my relationship here. 
That's what I'm saying. This is, see, I haven't even said anything about same-sex attraction yet. This is all about them. No, it's about us because, except actually it's not about me because I'm celibate. So whatever. Um, <laughs> this is about y'all. In fact, I remember, I remember talking to a priest and he was, he was going through, he was doing the NFP thing for a bunch of married couples or couples getting married. And he was sitting in on the class. And at one point, the instructor said something like, you know, a lot of couples, not everyone, because not everyone's the same when it comes to cycles and whatnot, um, a lot of couples have to abstain, you know, maybe one week out of every four. Somewhere in there, you know, maybe every one, 10 days out of every 30 or something. And he was like, what, seriously? So like, but then the other three weeks or the other 20 days, it's just enter the sexual embrace whenever you want? Like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, well, that's easy. <laughs> He's like, I don't have one day where I get to do it. So <laughs> it's a piece of cake. But this recognition, of course, that if we keep the, the sexual embrace united, then we stay united. See, this is where the church comes from when it comes to the idea, topic of same-sex attraction. Years ago, a number of years ago, the man that I love the most, my closest friend, um, best friend ever, um, he, uh, he called me and said, hey, I'm coming up to Duluth. I want to talk to you about something. This man I've known his entire life. I've known him his entire life. I'm not closer to anyone than I am with this man. And he, and he, he drove up, and we were walking along Lake Superior, and he said, okay, so um, I had to tell you something. I'm like, okay. It's like, so uh, I'm gay. And I was like, okay. And uh, I mean, it was big news. He hadn't shared it with anyone in his entire life. So I gave him a hug. We stood there on the shores of the Sea of uh, the Lake Superior, and I just gave him a hug. And I was like, well, you know, I love you. He's like, yeah, I know. He's like, you know, so I'm here for you. And he's like, yeah, yeah I know. And then he said, so uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> I thought it was like a press conference. Like, I made my statement. I'll take questions from the audience now. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, do you want to know how long I felt this way? I'm like, how long have you felt this way? He's like, as long as I can remember. Like, okay. So you know you have to believe me. I'm like, I, why wouldn't I believe you? So he said, well, um, do you want to know why? I'm like, no, I don't need to know why. I don't need to know when you started feeling this way. I don't need to know um, why you might think you feel this way. I mean, why, why you think you might. I said, I do have one question. I, what are you going to do? This man is Catholic, you know, belongs to the Lord, knows Jesus. What are you going to do? And he's like, what do you mean, what am I going to do? I just told you I'm gay. I said, no, no, you, you, you just shared with me an experience. You experienced attraction to members of the same sex. That's, that's all you told me. I want to know, what are you going to do about that? Because an attraction isn't sinful. Having an experience isn't sinful. Like, because all of us, here's the thing, everyone in this room, we're attracted to stuff that we probably shouldn't be, right? All of us probably have some attractions to things that, like, actually, if you read through the book, you know this one, bound in leather, you know, whatever. You read through the book, probably all of us want to do one or two of the things that God says, hey, don't do that. So we all, again, it's not about them, it's about. And so one of the things is not like, well, I have this attraction. Okay, that's, that's a real thing. What are you going to do about it, though? He's like, what do you mean what am I going to do about it? Like, well, you have free will still. You can either choose to act on this or you choose to not act on this. Just like. I mean, I have to tell you, confession time. I'm attracted to women. Like, whoa, no, like, no, no, seriously. So people are like, you know, you got, you, but you're a priest. Like, I know. It's weird. I thought it would go away when they laid hands on me. I was like, I got up, I'm like, shoot, seriously? Still? And yet, I mean, and I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just saying that, like, no, all of us, all of us have, have these things that we're called, we're, called to not just say yes to because you have freedom and that's the thing it's so important because so many times the world what the world will say is this is that if you have an impulse you got to you got to sate that impulse you got to pursue that impulse if you have if you have a desire for something you got to give into it that's why we need things like um, birth control because you can't stop the kids they're just going to do it that's why we need things like gun control because you can't stop the psychos they're just going to do it and here's the thing the church says this we don't want to control you Church says this, not to, you have got power, we're going to take away your power. The church has nothing to do with when it comes to like, okay, you have all this strength, but we're going to take away your strength. We're going to have this, all these controls. The church says, you don't need birth control, you don't need gun control, you need self-control. That's what the church calls us to because the church says, you have power, you have strength, use it. You can use it. You have more strength in you and through the power of the Holy Spirit than the rest of the world says you have. 
the church says, no, listen, you experience this attraction or that attraction, doesn't matter what it is. Under the lordship of Jesus, you can experience freedom in this. You can experience love in this, but the first thing you're gonna have to do, first thing all of us have to do, is we have to just be willing to acknowledge it and accept it. Here's what I mean. And this is like, this is just such a big deal for me. Because, uh, If you experience same-sex attraction, you're not accepted, you're not tolerated, you belong. But an experience is not an identity. An experience is not an identity. Because I experience a lot of brokenness in my, in my life. And if I were to say that my experience is my identity, then that would mean that I'm broken. That that's my identity is I'm broken. Your experience is not your identity. And so if you experience an attraction to this or that or the other thing, again, that's your experience, but it's not your identity. Because if it was your identity, then you'd say, no, oh, that's all I am. And that's why I love St. John Paul II a couple years ago, before, when he was still alive, he, um, before he was alive on earth, and now he's alive in heaven. That was a weird caveat. Anyways, John Paul II, I remember one day he looked at me and like 1.4 other million people at World Youth Day, and he said, he said, you are not the sum of your weaknesses of your failures or your sins. But John Paul II looked at me and he said, and looks at you, and he says, listen, your experience is not your identity. You're not the sum of your weaknesses, your wounds, and your failures. He says, you are the sum of the Father's love for you and your capacity to be image of Jesus Christ to the world. So regardless of what your attraction is, other people, members of the opposite sex, same sex, doesn't matter. You're not the sum of an attraction, you are the sum of the Father's love for you. Your experience is not your identity. There's a young man in our, our diocese, he's just an awesome kid. He came through our program and, and he, he met the Lord and he just came to things like this, pursued the Lord. But here's the thing, when he was about a sophomore in high school, he came to face to face with this reality. He's like, okay, so I'm same-sex attracted. I, here I am, I'm, I'm gay. And every time he went to prayer then, the prayer was, okay, God, I know this is what I have, but you have to take it away. God, if you're going to love me, you have to take it away. God, if I'm going to let you love me, you've got you to heal me of this. You've got to take this away from me. And so every time he went to a retreat, every time he went to a conference, every time he went to adoration, he would pray, God, if you can't love me until you take this away from me. God, you can't possibly love me until you make it so I'm not attracted to men. Until one day, oh, man, this kid, he's so awesome. When he was in, one day he was in adoration. And he's just crying because he's just tired of it. He was tired of saying, God, just please take it away because you can't love me until you make me better. That was, that's how he thought of it. And he finally looked at the Eucharist, like we'll have the Eucharist tonight, looked at the Eucharist and he was like, wait, Jesus, you know who I am. You know what I struggle with. You know my experience. And you still say you love me. So I'm just gonna, I'm just going to accept your love, even if you never take anything else away. This is the first step for every one of us. This isn't just his story. This is the first step for all of us, because all of us have something in our lives that we hate about ourselves. And so many times we can come to prayer, we can say, okay, God, um, you don't get to love me until you take this away from me. We can say to God, you don't get to love me until you heal me. The first step is, I'm just going to accept that this is part of my story, and I'm going to let you love me, God. Because I imagine that maybe last night, maybe in prayer today, maybe even right now, some of you are thinking that. God, this is my story. See, this is, I'm on the outside. No, you're not. It's not them. It's us. You're not accepted. You belong. And the Lord already loves you, just waiting for you to accept his love. And this is, this is ultimately the, the whole the whole part of it, the, the main thing all of us need to do is accept God's love as he offers it to us right now, regardless of what our wounds are. Now, he, later on, he said, you say, Father, you know, you always talk about this, you know, these kind of things, and, and he, he grew up with us talking about um, whatever kind of sexual attractions, whatever, whether heterosexual, homosexual, and he said that a lot of times the, the, what he heard was, you're called to say no, called to say no to certain things, which we are called to say no to certain things. But he said this, he pointed this out to me, he said, actually, you know what, no one is called to vocation of no. No one is called to vocation of no without a larger vocation of yes. 
No one is called to a vocation of no without a large vocation of yes. And the big fear so many people have is, if I live up to the church's teaching for living chastely in life, then I'm just going to be lonely. If I live up to the church's teaching, like if we say that the men and women who experience same-sex attraction can't act out in a sexual genital way on that attraction, then they're just going to end up lonely. And I know, I know about the fear of loneliness. I mean, that was part of my discernment to be going to seminary was my biggest fear was that I would end up, I mean, I pictured it really, really clearly. I was like, okay, I can see myself years down the road as a priest, you know. I'm in this drafty old rectory, you know, the, the wind's ru you know, rattling the, the windows, and, and I'm sitting there in my old rocking chair with an afghan on my lap and just stroking my cat, <laughs> looking out the window. I'm lonely. I know, the, I know about the fear of loneliness. And so oftentimes we can think that, like, what if we live up to the church's teaching, what you're saying is they have to be alone, have to be lonely. That's not true. John Paul II, once again, for the third quote of the day, John Paul II said this. He said, man, human beings, cannot live without love. Without love, we remain, a man remains a being incomprehensible to himself. His life remains senseless if he does not know love, if he doesn't receive love and make himself a gift of love. Now, we might hear that as a modern people and think like, because, and we think something else, because for us moderns, we think of love, we've taken this huge concept of love, we reduced it to romantic love. And we've taken this concept of romantic love and reduced it to sex. And so that when John Paul II says, man cannot live without love, what a lot of us hear is like, man cannot live without sex. <laughs> without sex, his life remains a mystery to him. He is incomprehensible to himself if he doesn't have sex and may have sex. And sex. <laughs> like, imagine, John Paul II, celibate priest. Like, he's like, yeah, my life is senseless. <laughs> love is bigger than sex. Love is bigger than romance. In fact, the Greeks used to have four terms, four words for different kinds of love. And actually, eros, or romantic love, was the smallest, was the least kind of love. Because it's the most, it's the kind that changes so quickly. I mean, you've all know Romeo and Juliet, right? How does a play start out? Romeo is going about, all, he, Rosalind, he loves Rosalind, Rosalind's the best, and he sees Juliet, oh, Juliet's the best, and I'm going to kill myself for it. Like, like, dude, you're crazy. Let the hormones calm down. But this recognition of eros is fleeting. That's why every, almost every couple that I do marriage prep for, they like, want to prove it to me that, that their love is special. And I'm like, yeah, it is special. You're special and precious snowflake, right? Um, and you're two precious snowflakes that found each other. Um, but they want to demonstrate to me that, no, our love is special. And I'm like, okay, great. And they almost always say the same thing. No, Father, we, we're not just in love with each other. I'm marrying my best friend. I'm like, oh, that's what everyone says. Like, <laughs> no, but it's, it's true. And that's one of the things is because we all realize that romantic love is fleeting. It's here today, gone tomorrow. But there's a deeper love the Greeks called philia, friendship. It's a more fulfilling love than eros. It's called philia, friendship. So after a talk I was giving at a university a couple years ago, this girl got up, and it was kind of funny because before the talk she was like, oh, Father, you know, when I was in high school I used to listen to, all, listen to your podcasts. And she really emphasized the used to, like, I don't anymore. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Um, but afterwards, she raised her hand and she said, okay, this is nice. But here's what you have to know. Um, I have a girlfriend and she's amazing. And she is so generous and she is so kind. She's incredibly patient with me. She builds me up. And when I'm with her, like, I'm a better person. I am kinder. I am more generous. Like, I feel like there's someone who knows me and supports me. And, and I lift her up too. And I... I it's a fantastic relationship. And she's like, what do you say about that? I said, well, sounds awesome. <laughs> Nothing she described is anything the church would say. Now, don't do that. Don't be kinder with one another. Don't build each other up and be, you know, provide some solace. Like, every, I said, everything you just described, the church would say, that's a gift. Everything you just described, the church would say, that's amazing. That's worth praising. You know, the church only basically says no to a couple things. One in, and one in particular is the genital sexual expression of affection. Because why? Because if sex has a nature, a what it is forness, there's no way that the genital sexual expression between two men or between two women meets the what it is forness. In fact, acting out on that is directly against the procreative element. And I can't act against it without disintegrating my own heart, my own life. But, but, 
for this girl and for anyone. But that friendship you found in this other person, fantastic. You commit to each other in friendship. Wonderful, awesome. And I don't say in friendship, wah, wah. I mean like in friendship, so much greater than eros, so much greater than romance, so much more life-giving, and so much more like Christ's love. So living out the church's teaching doesn't leave someone lonely and desperate and desolate and abandoned. The church says, no, 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 you're called to love. That in fact, we can't know ourselves unless we become a gift of love, not we can't know ourselves unless we have sex. But everyone here is called to deep and profound friendship. And if you find that friendship in a brother, find that friendship in a sister, it's friendship. It's love. And it's something that actually calls us to greater heights. But I know so many people, again, we're afraid. We're afraid of this whole idea. Like, but if you said this to people, that would really sound really, really mean. Like, if you actually uh, teach what the church teaches with regard to same-sex attraction, like, that would be, like, so condemning, and, like, you have unjust, injustices happening, and, and, like, bullying would go on. And I would say, okay, this is, this, that's interesting. What does the church teach when it comes to how we as Christians are called to treat our brothers and sisters who experience same-sex attraction? What the church says is they must be accepted, must be, must be accepted with compassion, respect, and love. So it goes on to say, and this is from the catechism, any sign of unjust discrimination in their, gar, in their regard must be avoided. But they are called, like everyone else, they are called, all of us, not them, us are called to unite whatever sufferings they experience in life, just like we all are, because it's not about them, it's about us, to the sufferings of Jesus to achieve the heights of Christian perfection. Here's what the church says. What is a heterosexual's highest call? Not to have more and more sex. A heterosexual person's highest call is to be a saint. What is someone who experiences same-sex attraction with their highest call? The call in life is to be a saint. So that means, who is it who is called to be a saint? Them or us? Some of us or all of us, all of us, every single one of us. But here's this kind of almost last thing. Um, okay, so, sec. I, uh, So uh, five years ago, I think, give or take, when my little brother called me and told me he wanted to go for a walk on Lake Superior, I've known this kid ever since he was born. And um, he came to Steubenville when he was your age. And it was one of those things where he, he knows Jesus loves him. He knows Jesus really is God. He knows the church was founded by Christ, that the Catholic church is the answer, is the one true church. He knows all this stuff, he, and he, he knows Jesus loves him. But here's the thing. As he was coming here in Steubenville, he would, he would have this thing. Where it happened all the time where he would um, he'd be praying, and it would be like time for adoration or whatever. And he would, let, he would begin to let Jesus love him, and then he'd say, but no, you can't love me, because if, you knew, if people around me knew that this is my experience, then they wouldn't love me. And so it took until he was 27 to call me up and say, hey, we talk. I saw him um, right before the 4th of July, and uh, we were talking about tattoos, which is kind of, you know. And he said, um, if I were to get a tattoo, I think I'd get a swan. <laughs> I was like, Cool, dude. A swan. I started making fun of him because I was like, okay, yeah, the most ferocious of birds. And, uh, or even majestic. I was just like, I was like, oh, a swan. And he's like, no, because here's why. He said, growing up, he looks at me, he says, I know you love me. I know you love me. And I know mom and dad love me, and I know the rest of our siblings. He's like, I know you guys love me. But I always felt different. He's like, I always felt like I was looking around and seeing all these ducks that were just awesome and they're all alike, but I felt like the ugly duck. 
Like there was something in me that was so broken, that was so different, that was so not worth loving. And he's like, that's why I couldn't tell anybody. I didn't feel like I could tell anybody. I didn't want it to be true. I didn't want to have to deal with this. And I just felt like an ugly duck. And I wasn't worth loving. He's like, but now I, I, I know that, you know, this is part of my story. This is part of my experience. And yeah, I'm not a duck like you, but maybe that's because I'm a swan. I don't know if I love or respect anyone more than my little brother. And the th crazy thing is, because I don't have to tolerate, I don't tolerate him. You don't tolerate people you love, right? You just love them. My biggest thing is, I just, I just wish, I don't know, you know, it's his story. He gets, to, he gets to keep living it, but I just wish he had trusted. Well, no, it's fine, because it's not like, it's his story, he, and he gets to go at his own pace. But I guess I wish that I would have communicated in some way that if he wanted to, he could have told me earlier. In some way that, you know, because we all carry around some kind of shame, right? We all carry around some kind of wound. That, like, you, at some point you can just share it with the people you know love you and you know they're going to keep loving you. But for whatever reason he didn't, I don't know. It's a funny thing, though, because at one point we had a conversation. And he was like, okay, what I want more than anything else, I want you to accept me. Okay, what does that mean? Well, dude, like, I, I call him dude a lot. But like, dude, what do you mean? You know I love you. He's like, no, I want you to, either you, either you celebrate every decision I make or it means you hate me. I was like, that's not real. In fact, my dad was like, what? <laughs> this is good. We have a really honest family with each other. I love that so much. My dad was like, what? Bruh. My dad doesn't say that. But... My dad was like, what? Are you kidding? He's like, he says, no good parent accepts every decision their child makes. He says, some parents do, but no good parent does. <laughs> so he's like, Matt, little brother, um, we love you. We're, you're all, we're gonna celebrate you. We don't have to agree with every decision you make. I think that's sometimes the, uh, the box we get put in. It's either you embrace every decision someone makes or that means you hate them. But you realize there's, that's no, there's no real relationship on the planet that's like that. Imagine having a friend that says, okay, you must celebrate every decision I make or that means you hate me. Like, <laughs> I'm beginning to hate you right now. <laughs> but there's, those are two ways. There's a third way. And the third way is I'm not going to tolerate. I'm not going to hate. I'm just going to love means we're going to disagree sometimes. There's, it's going to mean that you're going to disagree with me sometimes. It's going to mean that sometimes you'll do stuff that I wish you didn't do, and I'm going to do stuff that you wish I didn't do. But we're still brothers, and we're still friends, and we're still all called to saints, to be saints. Because the call to be a saint is not for them. The call to be a saint is for I just cannot wait. I cannot wait. Think about this day. I know so many men and women who are Catholic, who are dedicated to Jesus Christ, to experience same-sex attraction, and they commit their lives. Like, no, I'm going to live chastely. I'm going to have as many great friendships as possible. I'm going to dive into prayer as deeply as possible. I'm going to serve and love people as deeply as possible. And they have these incredibly full lives and the incredibly transformed lives. These people, these men and women, they're like, no, my experience is I'm same-sex attracted. I always have been. I don't know if it ever changed. Doesn't matter, though, because what I can do is I know I'm called to love, called to friendship, called to chastity, called to be a saint, and I cannot wait for the day. I cannot wait for the day when the church canonizes the first known homosexual man or homosexual woman saint who dedicated their lives to living chastely in abundant love in the power of Jesus Christ. Because that will be an incredible day, an incredible day <laughs> when it'll be a message. And this, this amazing thing is this. The amazing thing is this. 
that person, that saint could be in this room. That saint could be in this room. Who maybe you always thought, no, I don't belong. I'm not not part of this. I need to leave. No, 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 no. No, no. You belong. And one day, maybe you will be the greatest, greatest, most powerful witness to Christ's love that the world has ever seen.